we're talking with Dick Schau, graphics pioneer and uh, the inventor of the Super Paint system. We have not only Dick here, but the system, and it's up and running. And I wanted to ask you, Dick, uh, something about uh, the, one of the um, best known features of Super Paint, which is its uh, frame buffer, one of the earliest, if not the earliest. Uh, can you tell us uh, something about the frame buffer and uh, perhaps a little bit of background on uh, how you how you came to build a machine that had one? Well, uh, Superpaint was built at uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center uh, about 1973. It was one of the first uh, frame buffers. Uh, a frame buffer basically is a, a piece of digital computer memory. <clears throat> which represents uh, points that are mapped onto a television screen. And in this case, um, if you want to pan over to the uh, screen here, we'll see uh, a picture being displayed on this uh, system. What is stored in the computer's memory is an array of numbers. Brian Wallace, uh, call extension 333, three, three, please. What's stored in the computer's memory is an array of numbers representing points on the television screen. And each number in the computer's frame buffer memory is uh, assigned a particular color or gray level, uh, which then becomes a dot on the screen as the television raster scans that picture out. In this case, we made this frame buffer to be compatible with standard television, uh, unlike most computer displays. And so we can uh, tape record it or uh, use it in uh, broadcast uh, television situations. And it's compatible with also TV gear. Um, the way you uh, interact with this um, frame buffer is primarily through the pen and the uh, tablet. And the uh, menu, which is on the left hand uh, screen. Here's a good point for uh, the demo on this tape, which shows um, how this all works. But the, uh, the basic idea is that I can uh, use the pen and tablet to point to various objects and areas on the screen, push down on those, and uh, activate them, uh, choose a color, choose a brush, and do painting and so forth, and uh, invoke various operations, which uh, we use to create the picture and to create animation. At this point, we could stick in the picture that has the icons on it, the functions, if you right. like. How, uh, how much time uh, do you uh, have to uh, spend on the, uh, at, at the keyboard, so to speak? What, uh, what, in, what are the in instructions that you put in the command line before you switch on to the <coughs> pen, pad, and monitor with the icons? Well, when you first turn the system on, you have to type a couple of things to initialize it. But after that, um, virtually everything you do is done through the pen and the tablet. The whole point here was to make a system which is usable by graphic artists who really don't know anything about computers and don't want to know much about computers. Right. That was your intent uh, from the beginning. That was our intention from the very beginning. And um, about the only thing you type uh, typically on the keyboard is the name of a picture or, or a file that you're recalling off the disk. Everything else is uh, iconic and, and uh, done through the pen and the tablet. Is the is the pattern that's uh, on the screen now uh, uh, has that been uh, stable since uh, the middle of the 70s, essentially, uh, or have you kept improving it uh, over it, the years? It's so. stable, stabilized sometime in the middle of the 70s, but uh, evolved for uh, for a while there, and then we just began. Uh, using it, getting artists to uh, explore its use and so forth, and it didn't change much uh, after that. Had, uh, had you seen, um, I mean, this is quite early in, in graphics, uh, really. had you, uh, were there other systems that uh, had uh, this approach uh, uh, that you uh, had seen before, or um, did you, did uh, you, come across the icon idea uh, perhaps uh, earlier on? Than, than well, some of these ideas were definitely floating around uh, uh, previously. Um, 
I had seen at least one uh, earlier primitive uh, paint program at uh, Bell Labs uh, a year or so before this. And uh, there were a couple of other people building frame buffers around this time. Also, I, I was very um, inspired by uh, Lee Harrison at Computer Images, who was doing uh, raster-based uh, analog uh, graphics, uh, which was video compatible at that time, which was quite, uh, quite exciting. <clears throat> but it seemed to me at the, at the time um, it made a lot of sense to combine the television technology and the computer technology, particularly because the cost of uh, and the size of digital computer memory had suddenly been dramatically reduced with the introduction of semiconductor memory chips. That made the frame buffer possible, affordable, and um, you know, we proceeded to build a frame buffer built around that and an artist's tool in, in uh, terms of software programming on top of that. Uh, the arrangement that we see uh, right now uh, using uh, one screen for output, one screen for icon paint program one screen uh, for the command line uh, is uh, is is this uh, essentially what you were using at that time or is this a uh, kind of refinement on it what as you recall back in the 70s uh, is is what we're looking at here essentially what you would have been looking at at that time uh, it's un it was unusual then to take this approach in fact it's still so uh, today we experimented with various configurations. You might want to pan over and see both screen, both uh, video screens here. <clears throat> we experimented with several different configurations at the time, including menus overlaid on the canvas, uh, separate text menus on the on the terminal, and so forth. And um, at the time, we we felt that it was important to have the canvas picture be completely unobscured by any menus or any computer junk or, or overlays so that the artist's conception of his picture and the colors in the picture were not disturbed by other, uh, other factors or other pieces of graphics. So we put the menu on a completely separate screen. They want it to be color as well because there's a palette uh, display of colors there and um, various other uh, functions needed to be accessed interactively. So we put it on a separate screen and with the pen, again, you can go back and forth between these two screens and do uh, the painting and do the control functions. Did you uh, did you have a problem <coughs> with uh, getting suitable uh, suitable hardware? What uh, do you remember just offhand? Sometimes hard to remember that uh, back in the years. Uh, what uh, what sorts of uh, monitors were available at that time? Uh, was it gear that was used in the TV studios? Or? The, the monitors and the video gear were um, fairly readily available in TV uh, technology. We use uh, RGB, that is red, green, and blue, separate video as opposed to the encoded video that broadcasters use, uh, but that's a relatively small uh, distinction. So we were able to use cameras, monitors, tape recorders, readily available uh, for the most part video gear. The um, computer itself, the CPU, central processor that uh, is used here is a uh, uh, standard mini computer of that, of those, uh, of that period, a data general uh, Nova 800, 16-bit mini computer. Uh, the tablets were readily uh, available, and the only thing that was really missing was the frame buffer and the frame buffer technology. So we had to build that uh, ourselves and connect things in what, what was a somewhat unusual way for that time. But it, it was kind of fortuitous. Things sort of uh, appeared at the right times. Um, for example, also the uh, uh, analog to digital conversion hardware necessary to take video and grab it, uh, bring it into the frame buffer and capture it, uh, had just become available and fast enough to do this at video rates. So we bought uh, a um, analog to digital converter, which is in a large box costing uh, twelve or fourteen thousand dollars at the time. Had just come on the market, but of course now you can get that in a chip uh, for a few tens of dollars uh, to do the same thing. But uh, the technology made it possible all of that just in those few years. Uh, the the mainframe that's in the next room is the is the uh, same one that you used throughout, or did you move the frame buffer to? 
from one mainframe to another. It's no, it's all in the same configuration it was from the start. So the only difference uh, in uh, what we have here is uh, on the table, so to speak. Uh, what about the, uh, the uh, terminal, terminal there? The terminal is the original terminal. Uh -huh. The only thing that's not original on this table are the two monitors, actually. Okay. Um, and th those are not original simply because they were damaged by shippers and uh, generally abused over the years. So. Did you, uh, uh, you say damaged by shippers, did you, uh, uh, the, the machine here has uh, seen use uh, in more than one site, uh, I know. Um, you had it uh, with uh, NASA Ames uh, when you were doing the uh, Pioneer work. 1978, uh, we took it over to NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View and set it up for a period of a week or two uh, during the Pioneer Venus uh, encounter in 1978, and then again in 1979 for Pioneer Saturn. Um, other than that, the system has not uh, had many uh, trips, or not, not gone uh, very many places, but that was its Pioneer Venus and Pioneer Saturn were its first major outings and its first uh, major use on uh, broadcast television, network television. Other than that, people would come to you and you'd make the tapes at zero spot. We worked with um, some uh, PBS series that were being produced at KQD in San Francisco uh, and some other applications, but mostly the artists would come to us, try the system, take away some videotape uh, as the, their form of output. Uh, getting back to the, to the uh, frame buffer again, would you say that the frame buffer uh, Approach is so central to raster graphics that, uh, that that without it there is no raster graphics, so to speak. I mean, oh yeah, the frame buffer. Oh, no, the frame buffer is absolutely the key to raster uh, graphics. Had anyone tried doing graphics applications of any of any kind uh, without a frame buffer? I'm just I'm, I'm trying to imagine the system without one, and, and I can't because it's been with us forever. So. Right. Well, beyond. Uh, vector graphics, which, which preceded this whole era, um, there were simple um, uh, raster-based graphics generators, such as character generators, text and titling generators, made by several people. Um, those had no frame buffers. They generated the video display on the fly, much like a uh, video game machine would do, or uh, uh, some of today's titlers uh, still use the same on-the-fly generation. There were um, flight simulators. Pilot training and uh, aircraft uh, pilot simulators, uh, which were being built around that time by um, a couple of companies, and they used on-the-fly graphics generators as well, uh, without necessarily having the frame buffer. Uh, as we saw, uh, actually before we were recording, but as you put the, that uh, Escher uh, print uh, on the screen. Um, was that, uh, was that being generated, or is that strictly coming off the memory? Uh, what, what were we, could you redo that? And I could recall it, sure. It was coming off of the disk, stored as a complete uh, picture, complete with its animation uh, description as one file on the disk. What, what determines the order in which uh, things get put? Uh, it's, it's, um, stored in a fashion where each um, run of a particular color, a segment of a particular color on each scan line is stored separately. So it brings in the first colored area on each scan line, then the next on each scan line, then the next little piece on each scan line, and so forth. So the more complex lines take longer to, to read in. It's an unusual ordering of the, of the uh, data, but it uh, results in a much faster recall and storage. And a much That's built into the program? It's built into the hardware, actually, of the frame buffer. When you, uh, uh, as you were as you were writing the program, uh, you would you would test uh, each each feature. Uh, you don't have the you don't have. I don't suppose you have the source code available. For, uh, uh, not at the moment. It's on another disk. On a separate yeah. separate disk. Okay. Um, tell me uh, something about the, the machine. Or the uh, device in the middle there, the 
Yeah, this box is just the uh, controller for the tablet. This, the controller um, uh, sends pulses through the tablet itself, which are sensed by the pen and uh, analyzed in terms of um, time to determine where the pen is sitting on the tablet. And that results in two numbers, an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, which determine where the pen is on the tablet. Those are reported to the program. The program then translates that into a position on the screen and thereby a button. If I push down here, I'm going to activate this button or a place on the screen when I'm painting. Is, uh, is that the uh, original tablet that you had? Uh, it is, yeah. It is. And uh, that was available at that time yes. commercially? Uh, yeah, these were used at the time for um, uh, various purposes, uh, digitizing uh, objects and getting their outline and vector form into a uh, computer, um, uh, certain kinds of uh, mapping applications. So you adapted it from, from uh, vector graphic applications, essentially? essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you want to